Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Community Church. It's great to see everybody. If you're online, it's great to have you with us. If you're watching later on Catch Up, we trust that you'll be blessed. So uh, this morning's a great morning. We're going to be worshipping God. We're going to be uh, experiencing the Holy Spirit. And then later on, John's going to come and kick us off with a, a brand new series in the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I should have said already that my name is Phil, and I am hosting together with my friend Joe here. And Joe is going to come and encourage us to worship. Morning, everybody. Morning online. Um, I woke up this morning with a line from a song on my heart. A couple of songs, actually. Um, but particularly this one that was, Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you and I just had that thing about it's it's everything that we've got it's it's all that we are and um he doesn't just say you can come but you've got to you know leave that bit behind you know he just takes us as we are he everything that we've got he just wants us to come and he wants that to to worship him and and he it, even if it's like, uh, like it doesn't seem beautiful to us, because we come to him in worship, it's beautiful to him. And, it, and it's just everything that has breath, all that we are, never cease to worship him. So let's just stand up and know that we are accepted and beautiful in his eyes. <coughs> Praise you, Lord. Amen. Let's do that. Let's give everything that we have to him this morning.
is no higher name but yours. We worship you, Lord. Father, thank you that you have our lives in your glorious, strong hands. What an amazing place to be, Father, in your hands. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you rule and you reign. Hallelujah. The perfect man
When I was at school, we had this thing, and it was called a merit card. And if you did something good or a good piece of work or whatever, you got a merit. And if your card got full, you got some kind of a prize. I don't know what the prize was because I never got anywhere near it. <laughs> really. However, you and I have been handed for free a full merit card. You have been given and I have been given the merit of Christ. And we got the prize because Jesus won it for us. That whole pressure of trying to compete to get a prize is lifted off. We got the prize for free. All we have to do now is respond in gratitude and enjoy it. Um, in line with what Phil brought and with the, what, what Lars just led us in singing, that, that, that merit card um, is refreshed for us each day. In Lamentations it says, um, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. The mercies of God are new every morning. Refreshed, new grace, new mercy each day. Great is his faithfulness. Father, we thank you that we sit in a place where grace is refreshed each day, where mercy is refreshed each day. We don't have to earn something. Jesus, you have earned it already on our behalf. God, we thank you that you take away that kind of pressure. And Father, we can sit and rest and wait and, and, and rejoice in that fresh, new mercy, new grace each day. We thank you, Father God, that you've brought us into such a great place. Oh, the mercies of our God. You're wonderful, Lord, and we celebrate this morning and we, re we refresh and lament again on how good you are and what great mercy and grace you have brought upon us and that you bring it fresh each day, like manna in, in the desert for the guys back with Moses. You bring it fresh each day. Thank you, Father God.
Can we have a time where we just pray out that mercy over people we know? Can we just declare the grace and mercy of God over this town, over our families that aren't saved, over our neighbours, over our friends that don't know him, over our colleagues? Let's just have this time. Let's just lift our voices together. Let's just lift them all in one go, okay? Let's go. Lord, we just... Father God, we want to thank you for the incredible mercy that you poured out on us. Lord, for the way that your son sacrificed his life to save us from our sins, to reconcile us to you. Lord, thank you for this amazing, <coughs> amazing mercy. Lord, that when we were sinners, Christ died for us. Well, Father, I want to thank you for everybody who has been brought to Christ by that message but Lord I want to say to you that this is not enough that this is too small to bring true honour to Jesus Lord we are longing to see your mercy go far and wide that there might be a true reward a true yes a true honouring of Jesus for all that he's achieved for us so Father we pray for this town we pray for its institutions we pray for its people we pray for our friends we pray for our neighbours that your mercy might reach there and that Jesus might receive due glory for the sacrifice that he has made In Jesus name Amen Lord I thank you that even when you were on the cross, you prayed a prayer of mercy and you said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And Lord, we just, we just thank you that you are a God of forgiveness, a God of love and a God of mercy and grace. Lord, we thank you that that has changed our lives, Lord. And we thank you that it is changing other people's lives. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing. Lord, you are living and active and you are showing mercy. Lord, we praise you. Amazing God.
thought, oh, man. Okay, would you like to get comfy momentarily? Morning everyone, morning online. Right, only a few notices this morning, so we're going to be quick. Um, next Saturday, we've got a Saturday morning prayer meeting, uh, 8.30 till 9.30 in the morning, nice and early. Um, see you there. And then in two Sundays time, so uh, May the 22nd, uh, really pleased to say this one, Simon's getting baptised. So yeah, we're going to be celebrating... Uh, on Sunday morning with Simon, 22nd of May. Excellent. Okay, and then this Wednesday, it's the second in our midweek series. Uh, just to remind you, it's to church members, anyone that comes on Sunday morning. And, uh, oh, it's already up there. Excellent. 7.45, prompt start, uh, and should be finished by 9.30. Uh, but, yeah, if you can make every effort to get here for 7.45, that would be brilliant. Okay, and a reminder that if you pledge to give... Uh, to our building refurbishment offering a couple of weeks ago um, and you've not yet redeemed your pledge, can you do so ASP, AP, please? But thank you for everyone that gave. Um, and then this week's special offering is for Sakia Moyo uh, for the churches that he serves in Zimbabwe. Um, so in a minute, I'm sure we'll do that. Um, children are out this morning, jam are out, but you got in. Okay, I think that's everything. And that's the signal for the kids to go.
Okay, good morning everybody. I notice this was, oh, I'm very echoey this morning. Echo, echo, echo. Okay, okay. So I'm looking at Alex, I'm sure Alex will, will sort this out as we go. The notices were so short this morning, it caught me out. I was busy there listening to them and then thinking, <laughs> I haven't got ready and put my microphone on and everything. So there we go. You can't hear me, Jean, is that? Oh dear. Well, I can't speak any louder than this, so it's, um, it's just going to have to be uh, down to how loud they make it come out the speakers. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so as you can see from the screen, and as Phil has already told us, um, we are starting a new series this morning woohoo! Um, on the Sermon on the Mount, some teaching of Jesus known as the Sermon on the Mount. And you can find that uh, in Matthew's Gospel. So that's the first book of the New Testament. And it's chapters 5, 6, and 7. So it's quite a long bit of teaching. Um, now, that's not a name that Jesus or any of the gospel writers gave to this chunk of teaching. Actually, I found out it was coined by a guy called St. Augustine that some of you might have heard of all the way back in the 4th century. Um, and it's a name that seems to have stuck. So everybody now calls this chunk of teaching the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, it's become um, one of the most well-known and the most admired pieces of Scripture. The Christian commentator Michael Green uh, describes it as the supreme jewel in the crown of Jesus' teaching. That's uh, high praise indeed. But it's not just Christians who think this is great. Um, atheists like Karl Marx and Fidel Castro um, uh, have admired this teaching. Um, People from other religions have admired it, admired it too. So the famous Hindu leader, Mahatma Gandhi, um, he thought this was a stunning piece of ethical teaching uh, and made every effort to live his life by its standards. Um, it contains some very well-known verses. In case you're sitting there going, Sermon on the Mount? What's the Sermon on the Mount? It contains things like this that I'm sure many of you will have heard of. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. No one can serve two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other. It's got a story about building your house on the rock and not on the sand. And uh, if you remember back to some of our lockdown uh, video things, there was a very memorable rendition of that from our very own Chris Dudley. <laughs> Uh, when we get to that bit, we might show that video again, actually. That was a, a magnificent practical demonstration of the story. Um, how about this one? Choose the narrow gate and not the broad path. Love your enemies. Do to others what you would have them do to you. It's very familiar stuff, isn't it? And it all comes from the Sermon on the Mount. And there's even little phrases that have just gone into common speech. And the vast majority of people out there probably don't even know these come from the Bible. But how about things like, turn the other cheek and go the extra mile? It actually comes from the Sermon on the Mount. And it also contains the most famous prayer. So not the most prayed thing. The most prayed thing is probably, oh God, help me. But the most famous prayer is what? The Lord's, the Lord's Prayer, yeah. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You'll find that in there as well. It is a treasure trove, if you like, of uh, well-known teaching of Jesus. Um, and yet, um, the late great um, Christian leader and teacher, John Stott, says this about it. He says... The Sermon on the Mount is probably the best known part of the teaching of Jesus, though arguably the least understood and certainly the least obeyed. Hmm. Okay. Maybe you're just starting to get a little hint here that this is going to be a bit of a challenging series for us. Okay. So we're going to spend the next few weeks unpacking this and looking at it. Um, I believe this is significant for us as we seek to have a kingdom mindset and kingdom priorities. 
And I think it also links to the series that we've just done where we looked, um, where we were, we were looking to meet Jesus as we looked at accounts of how he met other people. Well, I think we're going to meet Jesus as we study his teaching together over the next few weeks. And, and by way of introduction to this series, I want to spend this morning telling you uh, why I think this is important uh, for us as we seek to have a kingdom mindset and kingdom priorities and how I think we're going to meet Jesus in it. So you'll be, I don't know, please surprised or worried to know we're going to read virtually nothing of the actual sermon, but we are going to read the verses just before it and the verses that follow it. Um, and we're going to start in Matthew chapter 4. It's going to, I'm going to jump around a bit. Um, it's going to appear on the screen. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. So Jesus has been baptized, and um, he's gone into the wilderness and been tempted by Satan, and he's come back in the power of the Spirit. And it says this, When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, that's John the Baptist, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, which is where he was born and brought up, he went and lived in Capernaum. And jump to verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then there's um, some verses, verses 18 to 22, where Jesus calls his first disciples. He calls four fishermen, Simon, Andrew, James, and John. And then come down to verse 23. It says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, and this is the first verse of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then there's three chapters of teaching that we're not going to we're not going to read today, but we're going to look at over the next few weeks. And then at the end, when Jesus finishes, it says this. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. And when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. So we're going to look at this in three sections. First of all, as it's the start of a new series, we're going to give you a little bit of background um, to, uh, to, the heart, to the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to look at the Sermon and the Kingdom, and then I want to look at how we can meet Jesus through this teaching. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this magnificent teaching uh, that we get to study over these next few weeks. Lord, may... Uh, we be changed and transformed by it. Lord, may we make, meet Jesus through it, we ask in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's start with uh, some background then. So over the years, there's been uh, some debate as to whether this is one sermon that Jesus gave or whether this is a collection of things that he said at various times that Matthew kind of gathered together and put into one place and uh, called a sermon. And certainly it can't be everything that Jesus said, because if you read it all through, it would take 10 minutes. Um, and uh, I think it's pretty clear Jesus was teaching for longer than 10 minutes. But given the detail that Matthew gives around the passage, about Jesus going up on the mountain, then the reaction of the crowds um, when he'd finished the teaching, and then what Jesus went and did next, he healed a leper and then he entered Capernaum. I think it's quite reasonable to assume that actually this, this is teaching that Jesus did give all in one go. 
um, and commentators that hold to that view um, think that Jesus actually gave um, this teaching over an extended period of time, a bit like maybe going to a Bible week that lasted maybe two or three days. Um, and what we have here are kind of like the summary notes of what was said um, over that entire period of time, the notes that kind of capture the important headlines of the teaching that Jesus gave. So from what we read, we know this happened uh, right at the um, very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Um, we read that uh, he based himself in Capernaum. Capernaum is a little fishing town um, on the northern shores of Lake Galilee, right in the north of Palestine. So no, um, no uh, introduction to a new series would be complete without a map. <clears throat> so there's a map, and you can see uh, there's Lake Galilee, and there's Capernaum, and this uh, sort of orangey blob here, that's the region of Galilee. So Jesus is basing himself in the Galilee area. Um, it's, it's actually a really, really good place to pick for him to start his ministry. Although Galilee is quite a small area, Galilee is very fertile and it's supported a very large population. So actually, in Jesus' time, Galilee was one of the most densely populated places in the whole of the Middle East. So there were lots of people there. Uh, and the Roman historian Josephus, who was writing around that kind of time, says about the, the Gal Galileans that um, uh, they were a people who were innovators and they were very open to change. So they're not like kind of like the stuffy religious Jews down in Jerusalem who were very traditional. But the Jews in, um, in Galilee, they were very open to new ideas. They're also on a trade route. Um, so they've got people from different nations and cultures passing through. It's actually a brilliant place to start a ministry and to gather followers. Um, so Jesus goes around the Galilee area. He's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, summarized in verse 17 that we read. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He teaches in their synagogues. He's healing people. He's driving out demons. And this is having a huge impact. It says news about him spread all over Syria. Well, Syria is this sort of light green bit that's here and goes on up to here. But he's also drawing followers from uh, east of the Jordan, from the Decapolis, from Judea, and then right down kind of like probably where that skirting board is, uh, Jerusalem. He is drawing people from an enormous area. And when you think that's an era where um, there are no mobile phones, no TV, no radio, not even bicycles to get, to get around on, people walked and everything went by word of mouth, it's an astonishing impact. Astonishing impact. And in response, we're told... Uh, that Jesus goes up on a mountain to teach his disciples. Disciples is a broad term for followers, so we're not thinking about the 12 disciples. In fact, it's not even clear that he's called all the 12 disciples yet. We know he's called the first four, but these are people who are following, starting to follow Jesus' teaching. All those who are serious about him, and it's Jesus' intention to teach them what it means to follow him. So he goes up on a mountain. This is not Mount Everest-type mountain. We're talking about mountain as in serious hilly country kind of mountain. Okay, The word there for mountain and hillside is, can kind of mean the, the same thing. So we're talking about sort of serious hilly country. He's clearly gone up there because he wants to get away from the crowds and teach his disciples. But actually, the other advantage of going up into the hills um, around Lake Galilee is you get fabulous acoustics. Um, so it's a great place to gather people and to speak to a large crowd. Uh, and in fact, so geographers have identified um, an area today in the hills just above uh, Capernaum where the acoustics are absolutely brilliant for public speaking. Maybe that's where this sermon was delivered. But the mountain's significant in another way too, because mountains figure 
quite a lot in Matthew's Gospel if you, uh, if you know about the detail of it. So when Jesus is tempted by Satan, the third temptation takes place on a mountain. Satan takes him to a mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, you can have all this if you worship me. And then Jesus goes up on a mountain and his glory is revealed to his disciples. It's called the transfiguration. He takes uh, Peter and James and John and uh, he's transfigured and his glory is revealed. And then Jesus commissions his disciples after the resurrection on a mountain. All authority on, in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus says, but it happens on a mountain. And um, it's where Je Matthew records Jesus as saying goodbye to the disciples. But here, for this bit of teaching, we are intended to see um, a parallel with another mountain. A mountain from the Old Testament. Anybody kind of think, any idea of what the, that mountain in the Old Testament might be? that Matthew's trying to draw parallels with. Yeah. That's, yes, Mount Sinai. We, we're meant to see a parallel with Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where Moses went up the mountain to meet with God and was given the Ten Commandments. You'll find that in the book of Exodus. Uh, we looked a little bit at that, um, I think, last year or or the year before. So mountain goes, uh, Moses goes up on the mountain, uh, gets the law from God for God's Old Testament people, Israel. And what we're meant to see here is that a new Moses, a much greater Moses, is going up a new mountain to get a new law from his father to give to a new people. And if you think about that, it gives, a, 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 gives some sort of weight and gravitas to the teaching that is going to come. So Jesus goes up on the hill, he sits down, he opens his mouth, it says, and begins to teach his disciples. And you might think that's, that writing is a little bit weird. Um, so you think Jesus sat down, and you might think, oh, that's nice. Must have been a really nice casual affair then. You know, it's like sitting down to have a picnic, but... In those days, sitting down was not a sign of being casual. It was a sign of authority. So rabbis sat down to teach. And when a rabbi sat down to teach, they were about to tell you something important. In fact, even in the, the secular authorities of that day, uh, sitting down was a sign of authority. So if you remember back to Jesus' trial, um, when Pilate had finally decided what he was going to do with Jesus he sat down on the judgment seat to give his verdict. So sitting down is a sign of authority and that something serious is about to happen. And then it says he opened his mouth and, and, and spoke. So you think, well, that's completely unnecessary information, isn't it? Unless Jesus is going to mime it all, which would be great to see, but really not very helpful. Um, but he opened his mouth and spoke is actually, it's a Jewish turn of phrase, which means... Something, very, uh, something of great weight and importance is about to be said. So he sits down, opens his mouth, and, and out comes from Jesus something that is actually of the utmost seriousness and importance. What comes is Jesus' instructions on what it means to follow him and what is required of his disciples. And we're going to see as we go through this that this covers... Every area of life it is very comprehensive. So it uh, is going to speak about our character. It's going to speak about uh, our influence in the world. It's going to speak about the moral standards that we live by. Our devotion to God, our ambitions, our relationships, our commitment to Jesus. It's in every area of life. Uh, Jesus is, is calling his followers to put him first in everything. And that's actually why it's incredibly challenging. So, how are we then to uh, understand and respond to this teaching of Jesus? I, I, I want to start off with three ways not to respond to this teaching. 
So one way that people respond to the, that respond to the Sermon on the Mount is just to say, well, actually, this standard is an impossible standard. So when you think of things like Jesus saying, uh, don't worry about anything. And you think, ooh, actually, that sounds impossible. Um, when Jesus says things like, um, I don't know, yeah, love, you, love your enemy. And you think, um, and pray for those who persecute you. And you kind of think, oh, that really sounds impossible, doesn't it? Um, and so a lot of people go, it's just so impossible that actually uh, we don't need to bother with it. It's, it's, so, it's so difficult, we don't need to take it seriously. And, and lots of Christians actually don't take the Sermon on the Mount all that seriously. It's the kind of attitude that... Um, the writer and philosopher G.K. Chesterton probably had in mind when he said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. And that's quite true, isn't it? I think if we're honest in our own lives, there are bits of Jesus' teaching that are just, we find just very difficult. And therefore, it's easy to leave them untried. And then some people, related to that, some people have tried to get around that by saying, well, of course Jesus meant what he said, just didn't mean it for now. What he's talking about is, is another age in, in, in the future. Um, you know, the age when Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rule and reign and everything's going to be different. And of course, these are the standards that are going to be in place and it's going to be easy to follow them. But not now. But not now. Too hard for now, it's for another time. And then some people see these as a set of rules and regulations that God requires us to follow in order to win his approval. It's a bit like Phil's merit card. You kind of see it like, here's a merit card, and if you follow these rules and regulations, then you get a, you get a tick on there. And if you get enough ticks, maybe you get a prize. There are lots of Christians who uh, see Jesus' teaching in that way. And actually, the effects of thinking that way are disastrous. So it means that some people think that they can be saved, can come into a right relationship with Jesus, have their sins forgiven, and have eternal life by keeping a set of rules, which, of course, they can't keep anyway. And so you, that can lead to having a lot of very religious people who aren't actually saved. You may know some people like that. I've certainly been in churches where I've known people like that, very sincere, very religious, rule-following Christians who aren't saved. Or... Or maybe um, there are people who have come into um, a genuine relationship with God, but then think that their ongoing approval with God depends on them keeping rules. The posh word for that is legalism. And it leads to several things. First of all, it leads to insecure and very unhappy Christians. Or it leads to Christians um, who think they're really doing a rather good job and look down their nose at everybody else. What's commonly known as pride. And what it can lead to is a, is a church um, that actually kind of withdraws from the world and holds the world up to these standards, kind of going tut tut at everybody else, while failing to live up to the standards themselves. And that's called hypocrisy. So all these ways are not good ways of approaching, on the, approaching the Sermon on the Mount. The way to approach it is in the context of the kingdom of God. That's how we understand Jesus' teaching. That's what we need to keep in mind as we go through this series. So Jesus' ministry has just begun. 
And the central message of his ministry is repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, kingdom of God is something that we've spoken about quite a lot over the last few months, so hopefully it's a familiar term to you. But what it's saying is that with Jesus, the rule of God has broken into this world. Sure, there's a a final fullness to come when Jesus returns at the end of the age, but there's a present reality now to the kingdom as Jesus demonstrates his power uh, and his rule. And we see him demonstrating, actually, the power of the kingdom through um, uh, his healing sickness and casting out demons. And, And Jesus' call... Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, is a call to repent and come under his rule. And in the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus is doing is describing what that life looks like for somebody who repents and comes under his rule. The Sermon on the Mount describes the life that those who are subjects of the king are meant to live under. And we're going to see that it calls for a radical new lifestyle, different values and different ambitions. Starting with that verse we read, the first of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is going to begin to turn upside down every value of the world and then apply what it means to live under these upside down values of his kingdom. And just as Israel, who got the law from Moses when he went up the mountain, and the call on them was basically to be different. Do not be like the other nations. You are to be different. So, um, kind of like one of the key verses in the Sermon on the Mount comes right in the very middle of it, and it's, do not be like them. Jesus is referring to the way pagans live their lives, and he says, do not be like them. Okay, there is a call as we come into the kingdom of God to live differently. Okay, so it's important to see, though, that any attempt um, to live in the way that Jesus calls for is only actually possible if we have entered his kingdom through the new spiritual birth. It's what, uh, it's what Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about. I think Phil spoke about that um, a few weeks ago. Um, Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about how to enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again. You must be born again of the Spirit. And it is impossible to live in the way that Jesus asks us to live if we have not been born again And we do not have the Holy Spirit living inside us. Because it isn't about keeping a set of rules. And we really need to keep this in mind as we go through this. It's not about keeping a set of rules. But it's about increasingly becoming in practice what we already are by the saving work of God in our lives. I'm going to say that again. It's not about keeping a set of rules, but it's about uh, increasingly becoming in practice what we already are by the saving work of God in our lives. It's about starting to live that out, and only the Holy Spirit makes that possible. So it's the Holy Spirit who assures us of who we are. Romans 8.16, the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. We live out of that the already settled certainty that we are God's loved children and the Spirit assures us of that. It's the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live for God, the one who changes us to become increasingly like Jesus as we cooperate with him. He's the one who changes us from one degree of glory to another. He's the one who, as we keep in step with him, produces the fruit of the Spirit in us. And and the Holy Spirit is the one through whom we experience all the blessings 
of the kingdom, the righteousness, peace, and joy as we live the life of the kingdom. So as we go through this series, we are going to see that Jesus calls his followers to live in the way that he lays out and that he expects that it's possible. And yet at times we're going to see that the requirements that Jesus sets are so high that they seem impossible. So in one place Jesus says this, he says, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So there's a, there's a real tension there, isn't there? There's a real tension between the expectation that these things are possible and the realisation that actually these look impossible. And what bridges that tension is the grace of God. And uh, that's really great that, that came up, it came up in worship uh, today. Um, but we re- need to keep a real firm handle on the grace of God as we go through this. It's like Phil said about his report card. We've actually already been given a perfect report card, if you like. We already have all the merits that we need. They came to us as a free gift uh, through faith in Jesus of God's grace. We have nothing to earn and nothing to prove. See, the grace of God frees us from any feelings of condemnation. Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's the grace of God, Paul tells us, that chose us and saved us and adopted us into God's family. It's the grace of God that makes us eternally secure and makes us loved no matter what we do or what we don't do. We are not under law. We're under grace, Paul says. But but holding these things in tension, it is also the grace of God through the Holy Spirit that motivates us and urges us to strive for godliness. Paul says to Titus, the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. So there's going to be a tension here, guys, as we go through this. And that tension is resolved as we hang on to the grace of God. The grace of God makes us secure. The grace of God urges us to change. I said back in November... um, that we felt God was calling us as a church back to a kingdom mindset and kingdom priorities. Hopefully, that sounds a little bit familiar, at least to, um, to some of you. And in the Sermon on the Mount, what we find are the, st- the standards, the values, and the priorities of the kingdom. If we treat them just as rules that we have to keep, we'll just be a religious rule-keeping community. If we treat them as things that don't matter and we can ignore, we'll just become a bit of a social community and not look any different from the world around us. But if we're serious about being changed by this teaching of Jesus, and if we're serious about Uh, corporately and individually living these things out, that actually we are going to become a people who are are a prophetic demonstration to the world around us of what God's kingdom looks like. We are going to be a living, prophetic demonstration of what Jesus is like, what his kingdom is like to those people who have never met Jesus and who have never read a Bible. We're going to be a people who show things that the world really desperately needs to see, like honesty and integrity, kindness and compassion, honour for people, a 
people who are generous, a people who show the love of God to those that the world thinks are unlovely. And we'll bring the influence of God's kingdom into every place where God has placed us. That's the context that we need to, we need to see this teaching in as we go through it. We need to think kingdom. And we need to think empowering of the spirit and the grace of God. I should have clicked that on. Oh, there we go. So Matthew finishes his account of a sermon, then with a note on the reaction of the crowds. Um, because it's quite an interesting reaction that the crowds have to his teaching. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. That word amazed um, is a strong word. Astonished. Some of your versions might have. That's a better translation, actually. Uh, dumbfounded, somebody has suggested, might be a good translation of it. And it's a word that uh, contains an element of emotional reaction as well as head reaction. So we might say that Jesus had not just blown their minds, but touched their hearts too with his teaching. And if you were here on Easter Sunday, you might remember that we looked at an encounter Jesus had with two of his disciples walking on a road, along a road to a village called Emmaus on the day that he rose from the dead. And that he gave them an amazing Bible study and explained to them what was said in the Old Testament scriptures about himself and how it said that as he did that, they felt like their hearts were burning inside them. In other words, Jesus blew their minds and touched their hearts. See, the people on the hillside, I think, met Jesus in exactly the same way that those two disciples on the road to Emmaus did. And we have the same chance to encounter Jesus over these next few weeks as we study the scriptures together. We have a chance to um, encounter who Jesus is. We're going to see that he is the one who teaches with authority. Not like the scribes um, that the Jewish people were used to, who just used to quote other people for their authority. But Jesus doesn't need to quote anybody else. He just speaks it as, it, as it is. He's the one who teaches his authority. We're going to meet him as Lord. He is the one um, who expects people not just to listen to what he says, but expects them to obey it as well. He's the Lord. He's the saviour. He's the one who saves and shows the way to be saved. He's the judge. He's the one who is going to judge all people. He's the one that lays down on what criteria people are going to be judged. He is the unique son of God. We're going to see that he claims a unique relationship to God as his father. And if we've got eyes to see and ears to hear, we're going to see that the way he speaks too is impressive. He's not speaking to impress other people. He's not speaking to gain their approval. He's just being himself. And there's something clearly from the scriptures that, that when you look at people's reaction, there's, there's, there's clearly something that's uniquely attractive about the way Jesus spoke. <clears throat> it touched the crowds in the passage that we read. Um, there's a bit in John's gospel where Jesus is in Jerusalem and the, uh, authority, the, the religious authorities send the temple guards to go and arrest him. Um, and the guards come back having failed to arrest him and they say the reason is because no one ever spoke the way this man does. There's something arresting about uh, who Jesus is that comes out from the way he, the way he speaks. 
As we look at this teaching, we're going to meet Jesus because we are going to hear our Lord and our Master speak to us, speak to our hearts about what it means to follow him. And then thirdly, I think there's another way that we're going to meet Jesus in this series. We're going to meet him in the sense that he's not only the one who is able to teach what God requires, but he's also the one who perfectly fulfilled all that he taught. Jesus lived a perfect life of righteousness without a hint of hypocrisy. Everything he asked his followers to do, he did himself. So he can not only say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, but he demonstrated that in his life and ministry too, supremely at the cross. So as we uh, study these words of Jesus, we're, we're, we're not just going to hear what he says, but if we've got ears to hear and eyes to see, we're actually going to meet the character of Jesus in it because Jesus lived this kind of life. And we're going to see that it's a very lovely character. So there we are then. <clears throat> we are at the starting line for this new series and we're going to get into it properly next week with Phil who is going to start with uh, what's known as the Beatitudes well, let, let, me, let me just say in, in, <coughs> excuse me, in, in finishing that if, if we go through this series and all that you hear and see is a set of rules to be followed or if you're not impacted and deeply challenged by what you hear, but you find it just mildly interesting or not very interesting at all, uh, then all of us who speak on this series will have failed. But if through this series you see something of the beauty of Jesus, the beauty of his character, if you have a growing desire in you to be like him and live out the values of his kingdom, whilst at the same time realizing how far short you fall and how much you need the grace of God and the empowering of the Holy Spirit, then we will have succeeded in some measure, I think. And if we do have some measure in success in the way we teach this, then we will be changed from one degree of glory to another. And I believe this church family will be transformed. And God's kingdom will be extended everywhere that we put our feet. And I think that's an exciting prospect. So come at this with expectation and a willingness to be challenged and to throw yourself on the grace of God and the power of his spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's sing a song to finish with. Shall we stand? Right. We're going to sing Christ is enough for me.
recognize that your way is the correct way. And we love you. And Father, we so look forward to finding out more about your character, more of who you are, more of what you said, what you did, where you went. Father, it's a blessing to get to know you more, especially the people who think that they know you well. There's so much more to find out about you, Father. Amen. That was encouraging, wasn't it? That was challenging, wasn't it? And the best news is the Holy Spirit actually makes it possible. So there's hope as well. (laughs) Yeah, Father, we just ask that uh, you will help us to rise to this challenge, to embrace your grace and to embrace your spirit and to learn from Jesus to become like him. And Lord, can we start this week too, please, in a fresh way? In Jesus' name, thank you. Well, okay, thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for being with us online. And that is officially the end of our meeting.